and uh, uh, we don't get together right now, so we can't have our normal Purim festivities. Uh, most synagogues don't have Purim festivities when when uh, when we have a, co a COVID situation, a pandemic, uh, and we'll back. Hopefully, we'll get back to normal next week and uh, next year and be able to have Purim again. But in the meantime, I thought you'd enjoy this picture of um, two friends of mine. Uh, you know the person, the man, because you've been reading his book called The Complete Jewish Bible for many years. Uh, many of you have. Uh, and uh, his wife there, Martha, they're dressed from, for Purim back in Israel. And they sent this out. And I said to Lisa, let's, let's put this out there so people can see it. Uh, when we begin our talk about uh, Purim. Um, so they're dressed in the costume and they, they, uh, they enjoy dressing up all the time. Uh, I know David is the more uh, somber person, but Martha dresses him up and he tolerates it, as you can see there. But they're great people. Uh, we, we will meet them again next time we go to Israel. And, uh, and they're good friends of mine and Lisa's. So just want to show you that picture. But my talk is Purim an underrated, the most underrated Jewish holiday um, for Gentiles. So Purim is the most underrated Jewish holiday, holiday for Gentiles. Now, I hope that got your attention, if, especially if you're a Gentile, because you say to yourself, well, you we don't even know about much about Purim. How could that be an underrated Jewish holiday for you? But that's why I'm going to talk about Purim for a few minutes. So you get the background uh, of this holiday. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's really meant to be uh, uh, just a joyous time with uh, sometimes musicals, plays, skits, a lot of humor, costumes, festivals, carnivals to celebrate something. And that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. Um, many years ago, many years ago, the king of Persia, which is now... Uh, uh, um, Persia is now Iran now, Iran. I don't like to call it Iran. I prefer letting it be Persia, but, uh, you know, the world uh, has changed the, uh, the, uh, the names of these countries. But many years ago, the king of Persia was really the dominant ruler of most of the world. And this is not just story, this is reality. His name was King Ash Ash Ahasuerus, and he was, he was a very prom prominent and powerful king. He ruled over 127 provinces in, uh, in, uh, in, in the ancient Near East, from uh, Ethiopia uh, to all the way to uh, uh, India. So he was a very powerful man. Uh, he, and he ruled what was called the, the Kingdom of the Medes and the, per and the Persians. They had, they had a joint kingdom, the Medes and the Persians, and he was the ruler of all of that uh, and was a very powerful man, as I said. Well, he, uh, he liked to kind of flaunt his wealth. And uh, one time um, he invited all of his, all the leaders from the area, from the area, from Ethiopia to India. So it was a pretty, pretty big banquet he was having to come and uh, celebrate. This is in the third year of his reign, uh, and he invited nobles and princes to some feast, which lasted not a day or two, not even 18 days, a 180 day party. Can you imagine? The people were drunk as can be. They were just partying and partying. Uh, I don't condone this, obviously, but that's what they did. He was a very wealthy king. They had nothing to think about, and these were all the nobles and leaders so they decided they could go party hardy. So they did. So in his empire, in the, in the empire that he controlled, this King Ahasuerus, there, there were many Jews living there. And, and uh, just wanted to make that uh, point known. Um, now remember, everybody's drinking from golden cups. They were just having a blast. The, the queen, King's, King Ahasuerus, uh, it's pronounced several different ways, so it's it's um, it's don't get don't get bothered by the way I pronounce it. Uh, the queen, Queen Vash, decided to give her, her own party for the women that came uh, to the palace. So um, 
she had that she had another party for the women that had come and uh, and they also were having quite a celebration um, uh, there in the in the uh, in the uh, in, in the in the palace I'm trying to get some of my stuff here to work um, so Queen Vashi had a big party and uh, you know she was doing her own thing so to speak and at the end of the feast the king was really drunk uh, ordered his seven servants to go get Queen Vashti from her party so he could show off her beauty to all the many men that had come from uh, all over the world, the all known world at that time. Um, Vashti, do she was, she was a, a, a powerful woman and she said, I'm not coming. I'm not coming. And so the king, of course, did not like this. So he, he was furious and he said, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to replace Vashti as my queen. So he did. He had a beauty contest and all the women in Persia were invited to participate in the contest. And oddly enough, and I say oddly, uh, only because there were, the odds were very uh, slim that she would win, but a, um, a woman named Esther, a young girl named Esther won the beauty contest. And the king said uh, at that point, well, we're gonna make Esther the queen because she's, she, I like her. She doesn't mouth off to me. She, she, she's sweet, she's humble, she's beautiful. And uh, even though she was Jewish, he didn't know that. So obviously it didn't matter to him at that point. So what this is going on here is that uh, the king's wife, um, um, the king's wise men uh, told him to get rid of Ashti and have a, a contest to find a new queen. So that's what, that's what happened. Um, uh, meantime, uh, uh, Mordecai, who was her uncle uh, and was a, a great man, godly man, uh, uh, heard about um, this plot. Excuse me, I, I, I'm, my pages are off here for some reason. Um, Anyway, uh, let me let me continue. So um, there was a, a, a the uh, little while longer. Mordecai was guarding the king's gate, and he overheard two men speaking of uh, a plot to kill the king. So Mordecai warned Esther about this, and she told the king, which of course endeared her to him. The two plotters that were going to kill the king were arrested, found guilty, and off of their heads. They were hung on a tree. Their plot was recorded, though, in the, in the, in the King's Chronicles, uh, the, the books that kept records of everything the king said and did. That was just part of his ego trip. And it was noted that Mordecai had uncovered this horrible plot. Meantime, Haman, who I, I guess if you know the story of Purim and the celebration, when you hear the name Haman, you're supposed to boo to stomp out his name. Uh, that's a longer story I'll tell you another time but Haman plotted to kill the Jews. Why? Because um, Mordecai, Esther's uncle, would not bow down to Haman when he, walked, when he walked through town. Everybody else bowed down to Haman because Haman was the number two guy in, in, in Persia and he liked everybody to show him that kind of respect. Well, um, King, uh, Mordecai would not do that because he would not bow down to anybody but God. Uh, he just wouldn't. It, that was important to him. So um, uh, uh, all the servants did bow down, but not Mordecai. Um, so this made Haman just furious, and he schemed to find a way to punish uh, Mordecai uh, along, with the, along with all of his people, the Jews. So this is called genocide, and we know that this is a fact of history. We know that it happens now. Uh, we know that it's happening in China. We know it's happened in Africa, different places. And we know that the, uh, about 60, 80 years ago, the Jewish people were, were destined to genocide from Adolf Hitler. So why did, why did Hitler want to do that? Nobody really knows for sure. But, but throughout Jewish history, there have been times when leaders just decided they wanted to kill the Jews. I have theories about that. There are many theories about what's going on. Uh, ultimately, I believe this, the, the evil ones, the evil ones' hand, fingerprints are all over that kind of thing. 
and that's what was happening here in the in the time of of um, Haman wanted to kill the not only Mordecai but all of Mordecai's people. So um, the king told uh, Haman after he was tricked that uh, he could do it. Uh, what happened was Haman uh, came to the king thinking he would get a reward for uh, being who he was. And, uh, and instead of him getting the reward, uh, Mordecai got the reward that he would be paraded around all of Persia on a horse and everybody would have bowed down to him. Well, Haman was really even more furious at that time. So he, he set out to really attack the Jewish people. So Mordecai at this time decides he would appeal to his lovely niece Esther to help out. Because when he heard that uh, Mordecai had gotten, that Haman had gotten the king to agree to kill all the Jews, he was, he was uh, devastated. He tore his clothes, it said, put on sackcloth and ashes, which is a sign of mourning. And he publicly walked around bitterly crying because of what was happening. So Esther was sent to the king's servants with clothes to to give back to Mordecai, but he refused to put them on because he was in a state of mourning and he would not put, he would not do anything to get out of the state of mourning until he could help his people, the Jews. So he pleaded with Esther to go to the king, because remember she was now married to the king and, and asked, to, asked that her people would be saved. Well, Esther knew that anybody would go to the king without the king, any woman that went to the king without being summoned by the king would be killed or, or were, were subject to being killed. So Esther thought, I, I can't just do that. I'll be, I'll be killed. So what did Esther do? She replied to Mordecai. She said, gather all the Jews in, in Shushan to pray and fast for me. Don't eat for three days and I will pray and fast with you. Then I will go to the king, even though he has not summoned me if I die, I will die. That was Esther's idea that she would uh, gird up with prayer and have a lot of people praying for her. And then she could go to the king and, uh, and, and ask for the, the release of the Jewish people uh, and risk her life doing that. So uh, when she went to the king, you know, he reached out his scepter and invited her to come talk. And he said to her, what's your request? I'll give you even up to half the kingdom, if you ask. And she said, I would like to invite the king and Haman to a special banquet that I have prepared. So Esther, the king and Haman went to the banquet, banquet uh, the next day and uh, the king said, well, what exactly is your request? And she said, I would like to invite, uh, I would like you to uh, uh, protect my people. And, um, uh, uh, um, so uh, uh, he said, who are your people? And he, he, she said, I am a Jew. And of course, Haman's jealousy got the best of him because he just wanted to end the Jewish people. But instead, Mordecai was honored and Haman was, Haman was exposed as the anti-Semite that he was. And uh, the, the king ruled that he would be uh, hanged from the same gallows he had set up to hang Mordecai. It's, it's a, there's a lot to the story, um, and I'm trying to kind of summarize it for you quickly. Um, so remember, Esther begged for the king's um, help, and, he, and he, he wrote a, law, a letter that was sent out to all the 127 provinces that the Jewish people could finally defend themselves against any attacks that came to them, came against them. So they did, and the Jewish people uh, gathered together and defended themselves about uh, from this attack on the 14th and the on the fourteenth day of Adar, which is this month. They were able to defeat the enemies uh, that that Haman had sent against them, and um, and they and they survived. So now, um, at that point, this holiday was made a permanent holiday. It says that you should observe this throughout your generations in all of your homes. And what I really like and what, what's relevant for you, if you're wondering what does this have to do with Gentiles, I want to read to you from, 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 from Esther chapter 9, verse 27, which reads, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring 
and all who joined them that without fail, they would keep these days of Quorum for the rest of their lives. I like that it says all who joined them. Well, who would have joined the Jews in, in Shushan or Persia when, when, the, um, when, when they were at risk? Because if you join with the Jewish people, there's risk involved. And I, there was there's genocide, which happened historically. And here in, in Persia, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, there, there was an attack against the Jewish people as ordered by Haman uh, before he died, obviously. And uh, yet there were many non-Jews who joined the Jewish people in this battle. And it says that every year the non-Jews got to join with the Jews to celebrate Purim. And that is why I consider Purim to be the most underrated Jewish holiday for Gentiles. Next year, when we can actually celebrate it, you'll understand why it's so much fun. Now, I did send out a couple of emails this last week. The UMJC, the organization that we're connected with, is having a sort of a, 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 a virtual Purim party tonight. Uh, I hope you got the information and many of you registered. If not, I suppose you can contact Tanya, if it's not too late, maybe you can sign up. I think there's, I think the sign up day was, uh, I think it was uh, today at noon. So if you want to get in there, I think you can. I, I think you'd enjoy it. I think you'd enjoy celebrating Purim because it really celebrates God. Now, you say, you never heard God mentioned in the story. We don't. God is not mentioned, but, uh, but the presence of God is felt sort of behind the scenes. And I think the message is that God is with us, even if we don't see God. And if we will do what we are called to do, in this case, what Mordecai was called to do, what Esther is called to do, we can trust that God will be with us, even if we don't see him uh, face to face. God is sometimes working behind the scenes. And maybe he's working behind the scenes in your life right now. Maybe there's something that's trouble, troubling you. Maybe you have a big, big problem in your life right now, and you don't know what to do. I would say if you're a believer in God, if you trust in him, if you trust in the Messiah, you can trust that God is working even behind the scenes. You may not see him, but trust that he is there. And uh, I'm going to turn the service back over to Carrie. And uh, I hope some of you, many of you will join the UMJC uh, celebration tonight and celebrate Purim. Next year, we'll, we'll celebrate Purim, uh, not virtually, but in reality. So God bless you. I'll talk to you soon. By the way, be back at one o'clock for our Torah discussion. Yikara Vikara Shime Rabba Amen. May his great name be magnified and sanctified in the world that he will create anew when he will raise the dead and give them eternal life, will rebuild the city of Jerusalem and establish his temple in the middle of it, and will uproot all pagan worship from the earth and restore the worship of the true God. O oh, may the Holy One, blessed be he, reign in his sovereignty and majesty during your lifetime and during the lifetime of all the house of Israel, speedily, soon, and say, Amen. Let his great name be blessed forever and for all eternity. Blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified, and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed be he, though he transcends all blessings and hymns, praises and songs which are uttered in the world and say, Amen. May there be great peace from heaven and life for us and for all Israel and say, Amen. He who makes peace in his heavenly realms, may he make peace for us and for all Israel and say, Amen. Session.